Hello, good afternoon, everybody who's, who's joined so far. My name is Matthew Ansbro, and I'm the Managing Director at Strategy Execution in EMEA. I'd like to welcome everyone to what we hope will be an insightful and useful session for all of you. And this webinar focuses on why strategy execution should be top priority for leaders. And it aligns very closely with an educational program that we've developed in conjunction with Duke Corporate Education called the Adaptive Strategic Execution Program. We really see this as the next level of education and development for those who are leading or working on projects and are, and are trying to navigate the complexity and volatility of the business environments in which we operate today. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez, who is a visiting professor at Duke Corporate Education. As many of you will know, he's considered a leading champion of project management and strategy implementation and is the creator of concepts such as the hierarchy of purpose, which was featured in the Harvard Business Review, and Project Revolution, which argues that projects really are the lingua franca of the business and personal worlds from the C-suite to managing your career and even your relationships nowadays. Uh, Antonio's research and impact have been uh, recognized by Thinkers50 with the prodigious award Ideas into Practice, and he's been invited to join Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches, the MG100. He's also the order, author of some books, um, including the, the Focus organization most recently. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions of Antonio. If you use your panel, uh, the control panel, then you'll be able to, to fire those questions on to him, and he will pick those up at the, at the end of the session. So uh, over to you, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, and, uh, and uh, welcome to everyone to, um, to this webinar. I think you'll, you'll find the, <clears throat> the insights um, different than what you usually hear in this space. Uh, we've been working uh, to position a strategy execution and the connection to projects over the past years. And, and I can tell you that uh, now is the time where people are realizing that uh, it's a hot topic. It's something that makes the difference in organizations and uh, it goes beyond that. So I hope you find the, the presentation interesting and, and looking forward to hear your feedback and your questions at the end of the session. Um, so that was me, Matthew introduced me. <clears throat> I wanted to share <laughs> a bit of research first on, on what has happened. How did we come to, to this level of, of uh, almost ignoring this topic for, for 100 years? And, and, and I, I find that uh, uh, shocking yet revealing as well, because once you realize that there's a gap, you can work further on closing it. Uh, then I'll cover briefly what I call the project economy or project revolution and the implication it has for strategy execution around the world. And, and I want to highlight three tips which I've used practically in my job so these things work. Uh, and hopefully you can take one or two or three away with you and, and put them in place. And uh, so I, I'll go through the slides and, and hopefully you find it interesting. So one of the research I did was uh, I thought like business leaders, not everyone, but many uh, go through an MBA. And so what I look into is what, uh, what do these MBA programs teach and, uh, and do they teach strategy execution? Do they teach project management to the future leaders of business, uh, public sector? And, and what I found out is actually out of the 100 top MBAs in the world, only two uh, teach something related to project execution, project management, strategy execution. So they do teach you a lot of topics, uh, but it often is more theoretical. Uh, uh, all the functions that a business has to do, marketing, sales, HR, IT, strategy, but how to put everything together that's a missing course, which is changing. And Matthew was talking about this new program from Duke and Strategy Execution. So there's quite some interest now to, to fill in that gap at, at the, the educational level. But the reality is that today, very few of them put it as a, as a mandatory course for the future leaders uh, in the business. So that's, that's a, a very revealing factor. Uh, the second uh, point I wanted to share with you is uh, uh, Harvard Business Review. This is where the new ideas come into place. This is where the new trends 
um, happen. This is uh, where most of the uh, hot topics uh, were born in HBR are published there. So what I did is as part of that research, trying to find out uh, why there's a, a, a gap and, 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 and why it has been ignored. I look at all the articles they published over the past 40 years and and based on topics, on themes, and what you see on the top is what really is in the top of the mind of CEOs, executives, uh, 4,750 articles on marketing, uh, finance, strategy, HR, leadership. So these are the hot topics. This is what everybody wants to know about. Um, but you see it going down the list you start only seeing strategy execution at the point 410. So uh, almost, yeah, 90, 10% uh, of what you see is it's on strategy execution, very, very little uh, attention, very little content as well. So uh, there, there, that just kind of evidences that there's a, 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 an issue. It has not been a topic which is been read about, not even taught at business schools, but read, and so executives don't read about it, uh, although things are changing. Uh, I've seen recently quite some articles on strategy execution in HBR. Uh, I myself was uh, honored to publish two on project execution recently, so there's quite some interest. According to some of their editors I know, they say this is a hot topic. So. This is great news for, for people uh, who are working in this space because it's going to become, for me, one of the top three issues in the agenda of, of leaders uh, as from now. <clears throat> then, so we agree that there there's, has been ignored this topic. It has not been uh, uh, top of the mind. But how big is that gap? And, and I wanted to share with you a small research I did uh, as well on trying to figure out how big is that gap. You saw that with HVR, the gap is huge in terms of publications. This is another analytics tool that you have in Google called Ngram. Here, what you can do is uh, search on business terms, the business terms that uh, were in published, and what did uh, Google do? Basically, they digitalized all the books they could find. So that's what you could see here over the past 100, 150 years. So if you put several terms in this application, it will tell you the, the, the gap between the difference, how many times what does the, that term was published versus the other. So what I did is I, put, I pick eight topics, eight themes that I guess you hear about it very often uh, at work, probably every day. And, and so I choose finance, strategy, execution, strategy, marketing, project management, accounting, IT, and sales. And what's interesting here is uh, if you look at, at what's the most frequent word, frequent term used in business books uh, in the past years, um, I'll let you think a bit and try to guess. Well, the number one term is strategy. Strategy is, is the top one. What you see here is interesting because the curve, the term strategy, was heavily used during the Second World War, 1940s. Then it dropped, but then afterwards, the business schools uh, really focus a lot on strategy, lots of publications around strategy. So you see that peak there and, and how it, it went up drastically in, in, the, in, in just 40 years. So strategy is something that everybody talks about and it's, it's a super important term. The second term here, it's, it's also interesting uh, because obviously if you're a business, you need to sell. So probably the first uh, business book that was ever published, uh, I think it was about sales, how to sell, how to attract customers. So there's a lot of literature on, on sales and how to do sales efficiently with impact. So lots of literature on sales. <clears throat> Next term is marketing. So it's all about branding and, and getting to your customers. You have accounting. You always need to manage the accounting and the finances. So there's a lot of publications on that too. But if you see then uh, the bottom, that's the scary part, or that's the gap actually, 
uh, which we're fighting and we're, we're coming up quickly but you see on, on project management of course IT comes before is the blue line in the 1980s is when you started to see some books on IT uh, project management and strategy but again here this chart shows you the gap which is huge uh, but we're trying to close so that's the good the good news is that things are changing things are changing for the good for us so that's kind of setting the scene there's a gap it has been ignored but we're working on that the good thing is that things are changing much faster than what we thought and <clears throat> we've all heard about artificial intelligence and, and, and several big disruptions that are happening uh, today in the business. They're often related to technological advances, um, but I claim that there's a major disruption which has been also not picked up yet by uh, businesses, literature, management thinking. And, and, and I think this is a massive disruption uh, which I want to share with you, which has a consequence in the way companies execute their strategy, execute their project. So let me just explain you what the, I mean with the chart is basically here you have on the left side, imagine that 100% is how you allocate resources in a business. Uh, your, your, your employees, your budgets, 1910, for example, there were very, very little projects in a company. Maybe there was one project every five years, and that project would be just a couple of people working on it. About 90, 95% of the organization was focused on day-to-day -day activities, what I call operations or basically running the business. Um, very, very few projects 100 years ago. What happens is that a lot of the innovation uh, that happened around management and, and business models was to improve the way the business was run. Um, so what you see is that blue area diminishing every year. There's more efficiencies put into place in day-to-day -day activities in running the business. So there's more efficiency unit, uh, slightly less resources. That happened with mass production uh, and the T model from Henry Ford. It happened afterwards with the tailorings that you need to be specialized in one thing, do it very, very good, just that one, so that we can accelerate and do more with less. Later on, you had uh, Deming and his total quality management concept. All the quality that you see, most of the quality concepts, and we're talking about Deming, but afterwards, Six Sigma and Lean, they're almost 100% focus on that blue area, improving running of the business. Lean and they hardly talk about how you improve your changing of the business, your project execution capabilities. That's not covered, it's a wide space there. TQM led to business process re-engineering and process excellence, operational excellence. Uh, all these terms uh, were all focused for the same reason, to do things faster, cheaper uh, on the day-to-day -day activities. PCs accelerated this process, outsourcing, you just take a piece of your day-to-day -day activities, you're running of the business and someone else, they will do it in India or in Romania. So as you see, this is a trend which it's not noticed, but what you notice is that in, I think all the organizations I talk to, they tell me, listen, Antonio, basically, somehow, I don't know why, but every year it seems that we have more projects and every year there's more people involved in projects. Um, they're not, of course, full time on the projects, but they're asked to be part of projects. And, uh, and so I, I think about 30%, 35% of, of uh, not a project driven organization, which would be consulting or construction, but uh, a normal organization like a pharma company or a telecom, 35-40% of the staff is working on project related activities and this just keeps growing and growing and there's many reasons. One reason is, is of course that launching projects is very easy and closing them or finishing them or stopping them is, is more complex so you end up um, always having more projects on the table every year so but there's 
there's lots of reasons. For me, strategy execution is doing both things right. You need to do your run-to-day business extremely well, and you need to change that uh, as well, extremely well. And that's what leads you to strategy execution, uh, both of the areas you need to cover. But I think the, 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 the interesting part of this, uh, beyond this chart and this disruption, is I was doing the same presentation in Odense in Denmark a few months ago. Denmark, Odense, they have one hub around robotics. It's probably the most advanced hub in Europe around robotics and and I was sharing this slide and this trend and, and saying this disruption has not been noticed yet and the guys was telling me the experts in robotics they were telling me, yes Antonio you're absolutely right but guess what as soon as we introduce robots and artificial intelligence we're going to take over about 30 percent of your blue space the one that is remaining we're going to cut that. In the next 10, 15, 20 years, there's going to be even a massive uh, takeover of that, those efficiencies, and, and it's going to be done by robots, meaning that, uh, again, more and more projects will be in place, and, and people will need to start learning how to work in projects, even with robots, how you put a robot in a project and make them part of it, how to use artificial intelligence to to help you allocate uh, the best resources in the organization. So uh, I think this is just great for us. We need to figure out, we're trying to figure out what's the consequences, but um, for projects and for execution, I think this is just very positive enablers, which I think um, we still uh, have not seen the full potential. So I think the future is bright. It's, it's We still need to uh, to adapt to it, that's that's the that's what we're working on too. And what's interesting, going a bit beyond the business world, is you've seen it impacts organizations. But uh, recently, I've been working on on some publications about the role of boards of directors, and they need to be much more uh, technology savvy, but also execution savvy. They need to have some people at the board who can help with the strategy execution. Some directors should learn the challenges and the tools available for selecting the right initiative, following through the right initiative, till it gives you the, the, the objectives. And, and uh, there's a couple of very good examples where the board were playing an active role in, in some strategic initiatives, uh, which led to huge value creation for the organization. Uh, one of them that we are investigating and we research was uh, the alliance between Renault and Nissan, uh, which probably you heard about today. Renault and Nissan is the, the largest car manufacturer in the world. They took over uh, Volkswagen and Toyota uh, early this year. So that, the board play a very, very active role. So that's, I think, an area that we still need to work further. Education, if you have children, you see today, it's all much more project-based education. You, you tell people, the, the kids, you tell them an issue and they need to work in a team uh, together to come up with an outcome in three days, presented. So it's much more efficient, much more uh, interesting to learn in projects than uh, the old times you learn it by heart and then you t t talk about it. So, and, and actually governments are, are looking into this space to how to accelerate growth, social impact through projects. I had the chance to talk to some people in, in Argentina's president, for example, they're using projects heavily to turn around the, the country and, and this happens in Ireland too. So I think the future is, is so bright for people in our space and, and, and it's not just limited to, uh, to projects in organizations. So basically, this is what I was saying, it's, it's important to find that right balance on how much you put into running the business, how much you put into changing. They're two very different business models. You don't run the business uh, in the same way as you change it. Business operations is about efficiency and speed and, and change is about value creation and, and long-term thinking, so there's always a big clash, a big friction 
Uh, and what you find often when you're working in strategic projects in your company is that when you're asking someone in the business operations to help in your projects, your priority, their priority is always the business operations. So, um, this creates friction and this is, I think, a key, key, key factor when you're looking into a successful strategy execution. Finding that balance is key. You've missed that balance for a while and you're out, like Nokia, uh, like Blackberry. Uh, on the other stream, you have Ericsson's who lost uh, uh, R&D, but they were not selling enough. So this is a fundamental topic in when we talk about execution. My guess is that very soon companies and executives, this is what's going to be a, a big game changer, executives will need to spend much more time, much more time than what they do today overseeing, sponsoring, driving strategic initiatives. What I see in companies, this is let's look at an executive, a, a, a senior executive, VP, they will not spend more than 10% of their time overseeing the strategic projects and, and supporting and taking decisions uh, to support that project to go through. My guess is that very soon, two, three days per week of their time, will be around execution activities, uh, uh, large change initiatives. So this is means new skills, new agendas. There's heavy, heavy work to be done on training, on coaching the senior executives to make this shift. I think many people probably in the call, they're, they're familiar with the challenges of execution. The executives has their focus and their priority has been on the day to day because of many factors, that's going to be a huge transformation. And you see that happening. Uh, I think we see requests now from CEOs coming and saying, listen, Antonio, I, I don't know how to manage this. I don't know how many projects we have. I don't know who's running the projects. I don't know how many resources. In the past, that would be the question raised by a PMO. Today, I have requests from CEOs, so they're noticing the pain. Let me go quickly through the three tips that I want to share with you, and I think these are <coughs> are, are key for successful execution. Um, so the first one, it's about prioritization, focus, and alignment. This is, I guess you've read that before too. It's, it's you hear a lot about these three topics and how powerful they are uh, to put the organization. Uh, running and, and, and at higher speeds, going all in the same direction. On prioritization, just give me, we'll give you a story because it's how you often learn best, but uh, I, I always heard about prioritization in my companies and, and I found it interesting and yes, you hear that so many times that it must be important, but yet nobody sat down with me and explained me why it's important, what are the consequences. So. Again, in my search of trying to find answers to issues that I face, I try to come up with uh, why is prioritization so important. So let me tell you a small example here, a true case study, true. Uh, the consequences of not prioritizing to the business, to the people who are on a daily basis trying to execute their work. So this is about the postal service. Uh, the story it was in Denmark and, and Mary has been working there for seven years. She loves her job, she loves delivering, she loves to bring packages, so she's very happy. But I think, I don't know, when was the last time you sent a postcard, guys? When did you send postcards anymore? Um, I don't recall when was the last postcard I sent. So basically this industry of the post and delivery has changed dramatically. So this company is struggling. Mary knows that if the company doesn't turn around in six months, they're going to be out of business and she's going to be fired. So that's a bit dramatic situation. The CEO and the executive team, they go out into a retreat and they come, um, try to come up with what's the strategy? What do we need to do to save the company to turn around? and to keep the people happy so that they keep their job. So they come up with a very simple strategy and, and the CEO of the post comes and calls everybody into a you know, town hall meeting. So all the employees are there eager to find out the new strategy to save the company. 
And this is what the CEO tells them. I want basically two things. I want that we improve efficiency. It's key. So we need to deliver a bit faster from six to five seconds. This is key for, for, for yeah, more volumes that will bring more business. And second and last is customer satisfactions. So we're here for the customer. If the customer comes back, we recur the business and, and we'll be there in the long term. So increase our satisfaction from 75 to 80. Pretty simple uh, objective, pretty simple strategy, um, clear because it was very well communicated, uh, cascaded, very well cascaded from the CEO directly to the staff. So everybody understood this, this, I think these two KPIs, strategic KPIs you find in every organization in the world. Right, so Mary takes this into account. That's the new strategy. We want to make it work. I want to execute this strategy. First, because I love my job, I love my company, and I want to keep working for here. So Mary starts doing this, uh, her work the day after. She keeps in mind these two new strategic objectives. And at one point during the day, in the afternoon, she's about to deliver a pack, and the door opens. The door opens of a little house, and there's an old lady who says, Mary, come in. And she is very happy because while she walks to the lady, she says customer satisfaction is going to be um, off the roof here. It's not going to be 80, it's going to be 100. So she's very happy. But while she's walking to the lady, she stops and say, but how about efficiency? How do I, I might lose not five seconds, I might lose a minute or two. I, I cannot afford that. What do I do? So basically Mary has five choices. First is to focus on efficiency and just ignore the lady. Second, efficiency, but tell the lady I call you when I'm done here around seven and then we can chat. Focus on efficiency and do a small talk. Just always getting very, very cold here and then run away. Or option four, focus on customer satisfaction, the second strategic objective, and just go in, have a coffee, listen to her as much as she needs to. And last option, focus on customer satisfaction and try to sell her the latest app for tracking goods. <clears throat> so that's the dilemma. What should she do? What would you do in her position? Remember, your project, your your job is a state, you love the company, and you need to make a call here. This is about execution. You need to make a call. And I see there's about 100 people listening. Um, I think some people will focus on efficiency and, and just and try to come back later to catch up on the customer satisfaction. The more sales people on the call will probably choose five, uh, trying to sell whatever just to uh, for the fake, uh, for the sake of selling, and option four is more the customer-centric people. Um, the issue here is that uh, if we would have hundred people in uh, this company trying to implement that strategy, maybe ten percent will choose option two, two five percent option one, fifty percent option three because it's the most compromised. A few people on the four and five. So what happened to this company? they went bankrupt. They all wanted to execute the strategy, they all believe in it, but the issue here, it was my issue. The CEO didn't give clear prioritization instruction. Even with two objectives, I, I, I cannot tell you the harm that you can do when you have more than two objectives if you don't prioritize. Um, so basically, I should have told you when you need to make a choice, choose efficiency or choose customer satisfaction. I want the 100 people deciding on the same way. That's the way we can move fast. So this is a very important lesson here. And, and let me give you another example outside this industry. Some of you maybe have tried a Ryanair. Ryanair, it's, uh, I, I don't really enjoy that. The first ride I had with them was a, a shock because they don't care about you, they don't care about the customer. And they tell you, they tell you, we're going to be the most efficient company, airline, uh, the cheapest, we're going to bring you on time, 
but don't ask for customer service. So in Ryanair, if you would have these five options, every time during the day, any employee, and it can be the CEO, uh, it can be the pilots, it can be the hostess, it can be people on the airport, all of them will always choose one always choose one day when they need to have trade-off. What happens with that company is so successful because they're great at execution. They all execute in the same direction, making the same choices when they have to. So here in a very simple way, I try to explain you how important prioritization is. Uh, hopefully you can see it now and it's not just words, but really something that matters. And the interesting thing is that who brings prioritization to a company? The PMOs. The PMOs or the Strategy Implementation Office are nowadays, most of the times, the one who help prioritization of the executives by asking them to prioritize and to make choices on the initiatives they're going to invest. So I found out myself that actually that was one of the most important roles I had to play. It was not about the PMO processes, but forcing the executives to make decisions and to prioritize. This is what I will call later around these new concepts on, on, on PMO. So prioritization is key. Focus, I, I take the example of Apple for my book, but basically the companies who, who have less products or less projects, they're well organized, they are competitive, and there's a sense of urgency. There's you know, in Apple, you have this biannual con convention where products have to be launched. If, if in your company you have strict, very clear deadlines that people know, uh, you'll get much more inertia to, to, to get the things done. If you're in a company where there's no deadlines, uh, uh, big ones, uh, it's not the same. You don't get that sense of urgency. Uh, excellence and, and discipline is something that you need to have in order to be focused. So these are the, the, the a couple of concepts which I think are, are very important. And in fact, this is covered by, by the framework that has been developed by Duke Corporate Education and 2080 Strategy Execution. It's about <coughs> the alignment between the different uh, groups in an organization and, and the work, the day-to-day -day activities have to be aligned with the strategy and, and where you want to go. So, And there's a constant communication flow um, not just once a year when you share your strategy, but this is almost weekly that you have to be constantly aligning in communication. <clears throat> so that's number one. Second, uh, organizational agility. We've heard a lot about agile, and agile is important. And if you're in the project management space, you find like agile is competing against project management. And, and I, I kind of disagree. I think this is a good addition. Uh, it's a complement to projects. I do believe that if you want to become an agile organization, you need to adopt projects. And I'm going to show you why. Traditionally, companies are structured like that, hierarchical with the standard departments, production, sales, finance. And that's where the decisions are taken, where the budgets belong, where resources belong. This is an excellent model for before, for when it's about efficiency. Now with the speed of change, uh, with the need to react quickly, the competition, uh, <coughs> this, this model just creates silos and, and it's very hard to work transversally in a team. So you launch projects, but still, the priorities are still on those departments. So it's very hard to, uh, to move fast. What happens now is you see more and more companies breaking those silos through strategic projects. And that's where the priority, the weight, uh, it's allocated. And, and if you're in a strategic project like that, you know that the resources coming from sales, finance, working on that project uh, uh, is their priority. They, they have to drop the rest of their work. So that's for me the the most agile organization is a project-driven organization. You need to mix, of course, the day-to-day -day activities with the change activities and give them equal power, equal rights, equal resources to accelerate that change. 
I've written recently about what I consider one of the most successful projects in the history, commercial of course, and is the iPhone. The iPhone, I, I really study how the iPhone was built. It's called the Project Purple. And there uh, you have amazing uh, lessons learned, how to do projects, uh, just sharing one of them. You can find probably later uh, the information. But one of them basically was they were picking up the best resources in Apple and they were telling you want to join that project, which I'm not going to tell you the name or what's about. But if you accept tomorrow, 8 a.m., you're in a new building, 100% dedicated to that project. You drop to day-to-day -day activities, we'll figure out how we get you a backup there. But tomorrow, 8 a.m., I want to see you in this building, the Purple Project. So there's quite a lot of lessons learned. And Apple is a very good case study. They're very, very good. They were very good at executing this kind of strategic projects. Then, so for the last point I wanted to cover is the strategy execution office. I think what you see is that the PMOs, the ones which are more advanced and who manage to to really show the value, they move upwards towards uh, the strategy space, the strategy execution space. And for me, that's the way. That's the way because they're, they're, they're very methodical, they're structured, yet they need to understand strategy and leadership. So there's quite some uh, things to learn to be a good strategy execution office or transform the PMO into a front seat um, or uh, body in the organizations. <clears throat> and I want to share this uh, small um, job description that I came across uh, a few months ago and, um, and this for me was another of the signals that things are moving, things are changing in the good direction for us. This is a position which was open for Nike, which I know you know. Uh, for their office in the Netherlands, Hilversum is very close to the airport in Schiphol. Uh, so it's an European EMEA role, uh, strategy and development manager. So it's not a junior, it's a, it's a manager position. Um, but for me, what was revealing and shocking at first, I could not believe it, what kind of competencies are they looking, Nike, for a strategy function? I would think for a strategy function, you need strategic planning, market analysis, competitive analysis, five forces of Porter, value chain. But here, what you see here, they want project management. Nike, for their strategy and development function, first accountability, project management. This is a huge, huge thing that has tremendous consequences in, in, in strategy, in, in companies, uh, because they, re they realize basically we need to accelerate the execution. Uh, in the past, I think in the past, I mean five years ago, strategy was probably from 12 months, nine months was thinking and analyzing. And just three months was about the execution. Today, based on this and other facts that I have, about nine months of a strategy function is about execution. And maybe one or two, three months max is about thinking and, and analyzing. You constantly think, you constantly change, but it's all about execution. So this is again a game changer. I claim and I predict that every function will need project management, HR, marketing, sales. Uh, so <clears throat> this is again great for us, great news great opportunities. You, however, if you're a project manager, this doesn't happen just like that. You need to learn. You need to learn the business. You need to have very strong leadership skills because you're, you're challenging the CEO of companies. You're challenging the executive team to go and to align and to prioritize. And then you move the organization along. So <clears throat> it, it, it means a big investment in development here uh, to get there. But the opportunity is there. So I think this is just great news. There's also some research and some data from KPMG, transformation study and, KP and PwC, where they say that 
um, project-based work is becoming much more strategic. So clearly they see also what Nike saw the importance of having those skills at the highest level in the strategy and function. So a big increase in strategic in initiatives to transform the business. Great news. And let me tell you just a, a, a practical, a, a real story which happened to me in my past, in my career, just to see uh, how the PMO has evolved. And uh, so this was a telecom company and, and they decided to set up a PMO at one point because they had many, many projects and they decide, well, all our projects, they have IT component, most of us, especially in telecom or banking, everything is now about IT and technology. So they said, let's put the PMO under the IT director. So that was great. And it worked very well. We had a team of about 15, 20 people working on the PMO with the project managers. It was a centralized kind of approach to the PMO. But uh, the IT director, which his name was Dirk, uh, Dirk was promoted and they said, well, great job here in IT. Now you're going to be the chief engineering officer. And, and what did Dirk do is he took the PMO with him. The guy was so smart and thought, wow, the PMO is giving me a lot of visibility on, on not just my projects, but the whole company projects. So uh, yeah, he, he was smart. He took it with him, the whole team just extracted from IT, put it in engineering. A few years later, Dirk was promoted to COO, Chief Operating Officer. What did Dirk do? He took the PMO with him. Very smart again, nice move. But that time, people started to realize. His colleagues, director said, hey, this doesn't make much more sense. Why do you take it with you? <coughs> and the CEO said, basically, we're, we're going to cut it. It has to be an independent body. We need to put it under a neutral office. They created the strategy PM office, and that's where, <coughs> where it ends up. So almost direct access to the CEO. So interesting um, the way the PMOs are moving around and, and in an organization was the right place. And what you see more and more is uh, uh, very close to the CEO. Often CEOs don't have that time to dedicate that uh, the, at least the most strategic programs, they tend to report to the CEO or their strategy execution office. Um, but they have a seat in the table now, a seat in the table with the other executives, which makes a huge difference. Not, not the resources, resources tend to be a, a few people, but uh, at least they have a say in, and they consider much more added value function. So my, my vision, what I see in the market, what I believe is uh, the role of the PMO or the strategy execution office, you do need a framework. You, know, you need to do what we were doing in the past, which is establishing some kind of common framework, common tools, some standards, some reporting, but that's the minimum. And that has to be light. That cannot be very heavy. If you focus on controlling, on checklists, on templates, you're out for sure in one or two years. So that's the minimum. And you need to be smart enough to just keep it to the essence. Keep the methodologies and adapt them depending on the programs and the importance of the program. But one size doesn't fit all anymore. Um, but we need to focus on that strategic dialogue. When you ask the executives to make choices, they talk strategy. They say, no, we're not going to do that project because our strategy and our goal is to increase customer satisfaction. So you will not believe how much added value you bring by focusing and prioritizing to the executive uh, through the PMO. That was one of the big surprises to me in the past years. Um, we enable our decision making. Actually, we force. I will I will not go to a prioritization meeting where you're discussing strategy, and I would not let the people leave the, the room if they don't make choices. Um, it's very important that they know that when they meet you, it's about making choices. It's about which projects to start, which projects to stop. Uh, this is something that companies are not used to, and it's painful, but once they get used to, 
is very, very healthy. Those kind of discussions brings alignment to the executive team. They come out of the room saying the same things, saying the same objectives, saying that the top projects are the same for all of them. So it, it, it's all a bit more intangible, but this drives execution. This is what drives execution. We talk about focuses. We talk about accountability. It's very important that accountability is clear, and we as a PMO <coughs> need to push for them. We need to engage the stakeholders and senior stakeholders to take their accountability. It's not the PMO. It's, it's they, they are a big players in execution. <clears throat> and that last part, I think we, we are really becoming agile, and I think the PMO plays a huge role in, in breaking through those silos and bringing a common mindset for the organization, what's best for, for the company as opposed to what's best for your department or your unit. So um, not easy. Any of these six points are not easy, but this is what is expected from uh, a leading PMO uh, or strategy execution office today. And just to finish, I think we have uh, still about 10 minutes. I'll leave five for, for Q&A, but uh, I want to finish with a, a, a story that uh, when I heard and uh, it really impacted me and, and it just brought the importance of, of uh, factors in, in execution which we were not covered before. And, and it's how to get that engagement of the teams, how you push people to go beyond the, the, the beyond their capabilities to to push a big transformation, a big project, a big execution of 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 a plan into practice. So the story goes: uh, um, it's about uh, the battle, or you know, after the Second World War, there was what people call the Cold War. So there was still fights. No people, luckily, not killing people, but fights to show who was the strongest in, in technology, in research, in PhDs. And one of the big battles was to bring the first man to the space. So who would bring the first man to the space and then back to the Earth? So the person had to be alive if you leave it in the space that doesn't count. Uh, and the US was fighting uh, very closely in this battle with the USSR, Russia at the time. And just a few weeks before the US was about to launch, Russia, USSR sent Yuri Gagarin in, in the Vostok 3KA spacecraft to the space. Uh, this was in April 1961 and back. So he landed safely back in the ocean. So they won this battle and then they were super proud and it was a big major hit on the proud of the US and, and, and their capabilities to show, demonstrate leading edge technology. But what happened a few weeks only after, just a few weeks, this is April 12, 1961. This is May 23rd, 1961. J.F. Kennedy, the president of the US, John F. Kennedy, the president of the US publicly announces to the Senate, to the Congress, to everyone through the press, that we lost that battle, but we're going to be the first man, country to put the first man in the moon and back alive. That was a big, one of the biggest bets in history. <clears throat> What's interesting is uh, I always consider him like a, a mega top project manager because JF Kennedy set that goal, strategic goal, but he gave a deadline too. He said, by the end of the 60s. And you know, guys, how important this tool we have in projects and executions are deadline, probably one of the most ones. And he, JFK, said by the end of the 60s. If he would have never put that deadline, we would have never been to the moon yet. So just imagine how smart this guy was and how project driven he was in execution. Unfortunately, JFK was killed the, the year after, 1962. He never saw this happening, this project, this ambition goal, this strategic um, um, plan happening. But the story goes, and what I want to share and finish is basically 
uh, they, they start to work on, on the project heavily in the US, the NASA driving the project and by 1967 people didn't know if, if we were going to make it. The deadline was close a couple of years down the line and nobody nobody knew if that was going to be achievable. So the press, the journalists, they, they asked for uh, a, a day of interviews in the NASA in, in, in Cape Canaveral in Florida. So about 30 journalists, uh, NASA, CNN, BBC, all these top journalists goes to the NASA and they, they interview the chairman of the NASA, the CEO of the NASA, the president, the chief research officer, the IT technology. So they have a whole day of interviews. Around 7 p.m. they start leaving. They cross one of the computer labs and they see a guy like this and, and they ask him, hey, what, what are you doing? It's 7 p.m. What are you doing here? What, what's your name? And he says, my name is Carlos. I'm from Mexico. And, and they say, Carlos, what are you doing here? And, and he says, well, I'm helping to put the first man on the moon. He answers to the journalist, I'm helping to put the first man on the moon. Imagine. The guy was cleaning the floor, but he was convinced that by doing that, the day after, all the scientists would be able to do their work, and together, the whole company, the whole country, were going to achieve that goal. So when you have that level of engagement, when you manage to create that engagement, you're an absolutely top leader, top project manager, top executive, and focus on execution. So. This is key to drive execution. Get everybody aligned and engaged like Carlos was. And that's it, I'm, I'm coming to the end. Couple of things, I think you, this, these kind of webinars are interesting and nice and fun, and, but if you don't do anything after, I, I think it, 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 it's a pity. So I would say, take action, take action. Keep learning, like I told you, the future is bright. It's, the future is today because these positions are available but you need to keep learning and, and becoming a strong leader. Second, use what you know to transform the company you work into more project driven. I think this will pay off. And last, really try to push people to focus, to take the calls, to take the difficult decisions. That brings a lot of value to your position, to the company, and you'll see how, 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 how much recognition you get from that. And with that, I, I finish here. <clears throat> I know that there's going to be further uh, information about the, these courses that are being put into place and there's one in January. I leave that to Matthew. So before that, uh, just if there's any question, please type it in the, in the box there in, that you probably see. Trying to see, I give it you one minute. The other thing, if you typed questions here and, and we don't manage to answer them, we'll, we'll send all the information later on. <clears throat> okay, I, I don't see any question at the moment. I, I had prepared one question myself and it's about the how can you become a, a strong uh, a, a modern project manager and and I think here um, the answer is keep learning the basic skills of project management learn how to make a plan <coughs> learn how to make um, a schedule make a, a good plan that that's a must this is something that you need when I hire uh, people in projects, they need to have a PMP certification. That's a basic. That's not enough anymore, but that's a must. Then keep developing yourself as a leader. We need to manage. We need to manage transversely. We need to execute change across the organization. We need to create high-performing teams. So that leadership is, is super important. It, it makes you uh, be able to talk to any kind of person in the organization. Third, understand the business you're working, understand strategy, understand marketing, understand what are the key drivers uh, that care and what, what's in the agenda of the executives. How can you help connect your work with the agenda of the top, with the strategy of the organization you're working for? See how you can help them get there and that's how you would probably 
it will take you a bit and this is development and investment but in two three years I think you would be one of the future leaders for sure in, in, in any organization Antonio there's a question here um, about organizational agility um, which says um, how do you help to avoid political or cultural challenges when uh, restructuring teams to work cross-functionally on strategic projects that, that's uh, it's a question and it's a reality because it happens all the time I think that most of the there's always some kind of agenda some people are afraid of losing power some people are losing afraid of losing their jobs KPIs are very much focused on on the day-to-day -day activity so there's a set of factors but I think the, the biggest enabler for change in these cases is having the CEO back in and, and he or she convincing uh, the team that this is the good thing to do uh, because it happens everywhere. When you want to be agile, you need to break some things and, and you'll get resistant. So unfortunately, the solution is simple but difficult. Get the CEO behind, otherwise don't start. Okay? because it's going to be very tough. And I think we're coming to the end, Matthew. We are, so yes, so, so just to, to wrap up then, Antonio, thanks ever so much for your, um, for your presentation. I think you, know, you shared with us that the future is bright given the importance of projects in business. However, you've also highlighted a number of the challenges that I think we're, we're all facing and that you know, there's work needed and a mind shift required in order to, you know, to transform the PMO into the um, strategic execution office that, that, that you call it and to really put you know, project management into the front seats but I think you've given everybody any, everybody food for thought um, for those on the call um, we do have a, a course running in January which is part of the kickoff of the adaptive execution strategic execution program we're doing one called aligning work with strategy which fits very well with this presentation um, so I'm going to send out a note to everybody who's attended shortly um, with more information on it but you're very welcome to give us a call on this number or send us an email um, uh, below. So thanks everybody for attending and thank you once again to Antonio for your presentation. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.